Coming back to economics, if I may. Sure. The leftist charge that the one of their charges is that the stimulus is not working because all of these billions, trillions of dollars that have been pumped into the economy are being sat upon basically by the banks and the corporations. There's all this money on the sidelines. And the conservative response is that that's true, but it's because uh, in order to invest rationally for the future, you need to have some rational prediction about the outcome of your investment. And with the Dodd-Frank regulations still being written and the health care thing coming down the pike, that they, that they simply uh, are reticent about investing in this uncertain regulatory environment. What do you think of the liberal charge and the conservative response? So they're both partially right. So, yes, there's a lot of money, in a sense, sitting in the sidelines, not being invested. And, and there's really, you know, one number that matters here, and that is the fact that the banks in the United States are sitting at, I think, on $1.5 trillion of reserves at the Federal Reserve. So this is money that they're not lending out, that's just sitting there. And that represents all that money the corporations have put in the bank, and the bank, instead of lending it out, which is usually what they do with deposits, they're just sitting it, parking it at the Federal Reserve. Um, so, yes, it, it, you know, that is, in a healthy economy, that doesn't happen. In a healthy economy, banks are lending money. Money is circulating. People are doing stuff with it. They're producing, they're investing, and so on. So, there is, there is that, um, you know, that charge has some, uh, some legitimacy. The conservatives explain it as uncertainty. And there's a certain truth to that, right? So businesses don't know what's coming down the pipe. They don't know how bad or good things are going to be. And in the face of uncertainty, people just don't do anything. They just shut down. But that's not really true. Right? The problem is not that businesses don't know what's coming. The problem is that they do, right? The problem is that they know that the regulations are going to be tough, that they know the taxes have to be higher, that they know that, you know, that, that, that economic activity is shrinking, not expanding. They know how bad things are going to be. So it's, it's a myth that it's uncertainty. No, it's the certainty that things are getting worse, that things are bad. Now, this is not an original point of mine. Uh, actually, uh, I mean, I agreed with it completely when I read it, but, but uh, this was in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that Cliff Asnes wrote. I don't know if you know who Cliff Asnes is. He's, a, he's a, a hedge fund manager um, in New York, a, a very large hedge fund, and a really smart guy. But he wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal. He said, no, the problem with us is not uncertainty. The problem is that we know. So there's this notion that economists think of this way and, and other people think that uncertainty is the problem. No, government's the problem. And, the, and we know that government intervention in the economy is going to increase, and therefore we're going to shrink our activity. So that's the, one, that's the one element that I think the conservatives get wrong. So they think that if we just knew exactly what Dodd-Frank was, if they, if they figured out, because they're still writing the regulations, right? If we just fi fi finished writing all the regulations, then business would sigh a sigh of relief and invest. <laughs> no. Or if, if Obamacare was just over with, if we just had it already, right? That's so we got to get it. If we just had it already, then uncertainty would disappear. Yeah, uncertainty would disappear, but the money would still be parked because things would be bad. So, what, so this is the question. Why do businessmen invest? There's a, there's, a, there's a title of a book. I don't know if the book's any good. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But I find the title intriguing. It's called Rational Optimism. The Rational Optimist, I think it's called. Businessmen are rationally optimistic. You invest a lot of money today expecting to get more money in the future. Right? That's what investment is all about. So you believe, based on facts, but it's the future, so there's huge uncertainty, that things will work your way and that you will get more than you put in. That's called profit. Right? But that's why they invest. They're, they're making certain assumptions that are positive about the future. But if, you, but if you look at the future and you can't make positive assumptions about it, it all looks negative. Things are bad. Things are going to get worse in the future. The debt is only going to increase. Taxes have to go up. Regulations look like it's increasing. Then you're not going to make investments because there's no way for you to profit from it. 
So, you know, so that's kind of the fuller, I think, explanation. Thank you. I wanted to um, ask a question about education. Sure. Um, because I have some younger cousins that, you know, are, are intelligent. They're going to really great schools, like Northwestern, for example, for economics, um, coming back and they sound, they're buying into everything that they're being told. And why shouldn't they? They're paying forty thousand dollars a year for the premium. <laughs> and you know, these are peop these are you know people that have grown up in entrepreneurial households because you know a lot of family businesses and so forth. So how do you stress these points that what they're being told by authority figures who are very you know who have PhDs et cetera is not truth is not actually accurate. And also, you know, I, the hard part as well is education is incredibly important, but the quality of the education they're actually getting is, is just not there. <laughs> so so the biggest that, scam but. in the world that's ever been run is run by the top American universities. I mean, they're selling you junk for 40000 is cheap. <laughs> like sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year at some of these Ivy League schools. And what are you getting in return? A pathetic education. Education that 150 years ago would be laughed out. Nobody would pay a dime for. So it's the biggest scam in history. You're sending your kids to, to and you're paying a huge amount of money to university to teach them that reality doesn't exist, or that Keynesian economics works, or that the 19th century was a horrific century for America, and that good for FDR, he saved us. So they're learning lies, and they're learning how not to think. They're, they're learning the exact opposite of what you would need to learn to think. I mean, it's the biggest scam ever. Our American universities are the pets, and the better the university, the worse the education. So if you have kids, the worst thing you could do for them is send them to the Ivy League school. You know, unless they're studying engineering or science. But in the humanities, it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. Now, what do you do with kids like that? I mean, it's really tough because the professors are very articulate. They're authority figures. They're being paid a lot of money. The student feels like they paid a lot of money, so they're there for a reason. They're to absorb this wisdom, uh, even though it's crap. And what you have to do is give them contrary facts. Give them books. Give them, you know, show them that they're authority figures, right? who say the opposite. Um, and, and, and today, in, in, with you know, kind of the internet generation, there's so many good videos right, on YouTube of good economists explaining how the economy really works. You've got to find them, and you know, maybe they'll listen to that because they, they certainly don't read. Right? And, and, you know, and these guys also have PhDs after their names, usually. But you've know, you got to find good content to balance it out. And then... You know, I was telling somebody, I think, yesterday that, you know, when you're raising kids, you've got this, these two elements that are contradictory, that are incredibly frustrating because they're contradictory. You know, on the one hand, you're trying to raise a child who will, who, who will be their own person, who will, have, who will exercise their own free will and, you know, make their own choices in life and, and be a volitional, rational being. On the other hand, you just want them to do what you tell them. <laughs> and you don't want them to have any free will, right? So it's the same thing. I mean, you want them to get it, but at the end of the day, they have to get it. That is, they have to do the work, they have to figure it out, and they have to be honest with themselves. But, it, it, you know, we have to understand that it is a great, what is going on in universities is a great tragedy. Uh, and uh, the guilty party are the professors. Uh, as a class, they are the guiltiest party in the world. They are, they are, you know, Leonard Peikoff always says that as you go through the educational system, the more degrees you gain, the stupider you become. Given that both he and I have PhDs, we can, I think I can, I can join him in saying I think that's absolutely right because it, you're in the system that is teaching you all these really, really wrong things for much, much longer. So it, it, it really comes down on you. But the only way to get around that is to have other 
stuff that you can get to, uh, other books, other videos, other content, other friends. Yeah. Um, is there still a value in higher education? Is there still a value in higher education? It depends. So uh, if you listen to Peter Thiel, right? Peter Thiel, I don't know if you know, but Peter Thiel is offering $100,000 to any high school kid who has a good business idea and who won't go to college, who commits not to going to college. So Peter Thiel is very much against college, particularly for technology. He doesn't believe young kids, they need it. That, you know, they, they, a lot of them know more than what they need in order to get a job in Silicon Valley. Why spend four years and $200,000 or more uh, in debt in order to get a job that you could have gotten when you were 18 before you went to college? Um, I think in the humanities, it's an absolute waste of time, unless you go to the right college, and there may be a handful of right colleges. Um, you know, in sciences, I think you probably have to go, in certain engineering degrees you have to go, but generally college is way, way, way overrated. Way overrated. And, and this is for a father who had his son drop out after one year. Uh, but he got a job. He got a job in the industry he was studying to get into. Right? So why did he have to go through four years to get the same job when he could have got the job when he got the job after one year? I mean, I was happy. And he was wasting his time. They were teaching him crap. They were. I mean, some of the stuff, the technical stuff was good, but the rest was nonsense. He can learn the technical stuff by himself. If you want to become a programmer, you don't have to go to college to become a programmer. Uh, so I think college is way overrated. Uh, it, it's also true that what we lack in this country, one of the skills that, doesn't, that, that people don't have, is we don't have a lot of um, uh, blue-collar, high-skilled people. You know, people who can really do amazing things with machines and with tools. We don't have that anymore because all those people who used to not go to college and go and become craftsmen and go become really, you know, or go to trade schools, right? Don't do that anymore because we, we've made college the new, uh, you know, cathedral. You, you have to go. It's a, it's, it's a part of life. And, and I used to, when I taught, I used to teach, my, uh, I used to teach uh, undergraduates and graduates. And, the, and undergraduate students, I used to tell them that they didn't belong there. I mean, they didn't care. They sat in class. And they, if they showed up to class, they were bored. Many of them went to sleep. Uh, they studied for exam just to pass. And these were bright kids. This was a, a private university. These were bright kids. But they weren't motivated. What, what difference did it make? This was boring stuff. It didn't interest them. And I said, go out and, and find a passion. Go travel around the world for a year. Go learn something about life and about yourself before you come into a classroom and expect to absorb all this knowledge. So on every level, college is overrated. Dr. Brooke, uh, I enjoy it when you speak about the Silicon Valley uh, venture capitalists. Uh, you uh, referenced them uh, last night in your talk. And uh, I think last year uh, when asked the question, you mentioned that uh, one of the uh, venture capitalists had set up uh, 10 companies, had taken them uh, uh, IPOs uh, last year, and uh, five, the only problem, five were in India and five were in China. Uh, can, is there any update on, on what those that are on the, the forefront of venture capitalism and the Silicon Valley are doing in this market? Well, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, it's interesting because Silicon Valley right now is, is kind of experiencing a boom. Uh, you're seeing uh, there's actually a lot of activity. There's a huge shortage of workers. If anybody here it, it can program mo mobile devices, move to Silicon Valley. They, they, they're dying for engineers. They, you could, they, you could, they could probably hire 100,000 uh, mobile programmers tomorrow uh, if, you know, if you just were willing to move there or to, to one of the other centers where, where these people are located. Uh, the problem is there's a mismatch between what the skills Americans have. Plus, this is off your topic, but Americans don't move anymore, right? So there's no jobs in my town. So I'm just going to hang around here because there's unemployment insurance and what the hell. I, I, I'm, I've got a God-given right to stay in my town. Right? But that, that was never the mentality of Americans, right? The, the, look at all the ghost towns that exist in the West. Jobs dried up for whatever reasons you moved. You went to where the jobs were. That's why we had these huge migrations across the country. People didn't, weren't just stuck in one place. So there's jobs in Silicon Valley. People won't go. Um, so you know, what, you know what they're doing. So this doesn't come from the venture community. But a good friend of mine uh, was, the, was uh, uh, one of the um, project managers 
who put together the Fire for Amazon, you know, the, 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 the tablet. And uh, Amazon would like to hire thousands of programmers. And they can't in the United States. They just don't exist. Like, if you get a, you know, you know this is another site, but related. 70% of all master's degrees and PhDs in the sciences earned in the United States are earned here by foreigners. 70% of all masters and, and PhDs in engineering and science are earned in the United States by foreigners. Only 30% of Americans. And what do we do once they get the master's degree or PhD? We kick them out. We kick them out. There's no way for them to stay here and get a job. And we've become very strict about that since 9-11 because we know that scientists, master's degrees and PhDs are known terrorists. Uh, particularly from non-Islamic countries. They're very dangerous. I mean, our immigration policy is nuts. I mean, we want these people to stay. They could be creating these, they were filling these jobs, creating new jobs, creating economic activity, and it, we, we send them overseas. And then the Republicans fight on stage about illegal immigration and wish as if anybody should care. What impact does that have on your life? None. Zero. But the fact that Legal immigrants, so we don't bring enough legal immigrants into this country, has a profound impact on your life. It actually reduces the amount of production and amount of income you can have. Anyway, so the story is that Amazon would like to hire all these engineers. They can't, so what are they doing? They're going to China. So he's thinking of taking a two-year assignment in China to run you know, a whole team of Chinese programmers in China. And they're not as good as American programmers. And there's a variety of reasons why we'd be better if they were here. But you, know, you can't do it here. So you're seeing more and more of that. People complain about jobs moving to China. Yeah, we're, we're throwing them away. We're, we're kicking them to China. Uh, because, because companies in the United States cannot find engineers because of our immigration policies, because of our labor costs, because of our regulatory costs. They cannot do business here, so they move away. So you're seeing that. But there is a boom in Silicon Valley because of mobile devices, because of, the in, because of Facebook and all, all the stuff around Facebook. Uh, if you go to South of Market in San Francisco, the place is booming. Rents are way up. Um, home prices are actually increasing uh, in parts of Silicon Valley. Um, but it's, most of that is the social networking. And, and depends on how you think, how much of that really adds to productivity, ultimately. Uh, or maybe reduces productivity. You know when people use Facebook? So you know what the peak hours for Facebook are? Like around 9, in, nine to 10 in the morning, East Coast or West Coast time, when people arrive at work, and then 3 to 5 in the afternoon w before people leave work. Right? Uh, Facebook usage over the weekend drops dramatically. Facebook usage at night drops dramatically. People use Facebook at work. So whether that enhances productivity or not you know, is, is an interesting question. So there's a lot going on in Silicon Valley, but there's a lot of that spirit that's gone. Uh, the venture capitalist that, I, that, that you mentioned that I talked to this year was complaining about the young generation of venture capitalists who are process-oriented, who are, he, call, he says they're all MBAs, which is not meant as a compliment. It has something to do with the more degrees you get, the stupider you get. Um, that they're, they're process driven, they're, they're about, he says, venture capital is all about asking the right questions. And they, the entrepreneurs, are the ones that have the answers. You don't have the answers. That's why they're the entrepreneurs and you're the investor. He says that's not how, you know, they approach it anymore. So you're seeing the effects of the educational system from his perspective on the next generation of venture capitalists, and it isn't pretty. Um, so. Are the humanities more to blame for the current economic policy than the study of economics itself? Yes, by far, by far, because first of all, there are a lot of good economists. Um, there are more good economists today than ever before. Uh, but more fundamentally, it's all those other philosophical principles. If you get all those other philosophical principles wrong, then of course you're going to get economics wrong. If you get you know, if you don't get reason, if you get, if you, if you, if you get, um, you know, egalitarianism, if you get any of the bad philosophical ideas embedded in your thinking, then by definition, your economics is going to be wrong. 
Because if reason is not the standard, how are you going to evaluate economics? Well, on a board with math and equations. It's called modern macroeconomics, right? It's all derivatives. I went to a macroeconomic class in, uh, when I got my PhD, and we never actually studied economics. At the first day of class, an equation was put up on the board, and they said, this represents the economy. And the whole class was taking deriv de derivatives from that equation and therefore consequences. This is what the government should do. This is what business should do out of an equation. I mean, it, it's, it's absurd. I managed to get out of my second uh, economics class. So I've only taken one economics class in my life. Because um, once I saw that, that was, oh, I'm, I was never going to take another one. But it's, it's so economics, the extent economics is corrupt, it's because philosophy is corrupt. And then the corruption of philosophy is not just a corruption that influences economics, but it influences everything. So it influences history, for example. Why don't we know history? Because our epistemology is corrupt, because we don't believe there's truth, because the postmoderns teach in the universities that there is no such thing as history, not in the objective sense. So the humanities are far more, uh, the impact is far more widespread than the impact of bad economists. So if we really want to change the world, we need good economists, but we need good historians, and we need good philosophers, and we need good psychologists, and we need good all the humanities. We need good people in all the humanities to be teaching those subjects from the perspective of reason, reason, reason. I'm wondering about the 1920s and 1930s. Um, I've heard really good things about Calvin Coolidge, and he was very pro-capitalism. And, um, and then also I'm wondering about FDR, and I've heard that he was largely responsible for the Great Depression. And then I'm wondering how Herbert Hoover kind of fits into that. So you want a quick his uh, uh, economic history right. of uh, the United States in the 20s to 30s? <laughs> Calvin Coolidge was, was pretty good. Uh, so in the... In the, in the, uh, other, in the um, Recession, I think it was 1920, uh, his response was nothing. No stimulus, no government intervention, nothing. It was a deep recession, and we got out of it almost immediately. Bam, the economy grew right out of it and continued growing into the 20s. Uh, it's, you could argue that Fed policy under Coolidge was off, particularly towards the end of his administration. Um, they probably printed too much money. Even though they were in a gold reserve, they cheated and there was too much money being printed, which ultimately helped lead to misallocation of resources throughout the economy, ultimately leading to the uh, kind of the stock market bubble and, and its collapse. So Federal Reserve policy under Coolidge was probably as bad as it's been since. It, it probably wasn't very good. Um, so Coolidge, then you get Hoover. Hoover is probably, you know, one of, one of the worst presidents in American history. And certainly the person responsible for the Great Depression. The myth about Hoover is that he was a laissez-faire president. That he just let the 1929 crash, stock market crash, happen, and then he did nothing. And then FDR came and saved the day by being activist. Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, Hoover was an activist president from day one. So Smoot-Hawley was passed and signed by Hoover. Smoot-Hawley restricted trade, uh, raised uh, uh, tariffs in the United States, which created a trade war throughout the, the world and basically destroyed half the world's economies. Uh, as a response to the recession, which the 1929 crash um, started, uh, Hoover doubled the income tax rate, uh, which was horrific for an economy in a recession. Uh, most of the regulations that later FDR kind of expanded and built upon were started under Hoover. Uh, Hoover was, a, indeed, uh, FDR's administration viewed itself as just continuing the policies of Hoover. So Hoover was a very, very interventionist president. So Now, what happened was that later in life, he became a pro-capitalist. So later in life, he identified that as a mistake and converted to kind of being a free marketer. And that's why the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, uh, which had Milton Friedman as, as its head for a long time, is, is relatively free market. And that comes from the kind of the later 
day conversion of Hoover into a free market guy. But he was a progressive Republican. He was very progressive. He was very interventionist, very much a statist as president. Uh, so Coolidge was, was good for the most part. Uh, the government didn't grow that much, but there was massive still misallocation in the economy because of the Federal Reserve, uh, which caused the collapse in 29, which would have just been a recession if the government had stayed out of it, but the government didn't stay out of it under Hoover. It intervened dramatically and therefore caused a you know, real banking crisis in 31 and 32. And by the time uh, FDR was elected, we were in a depression. So you can't blame FDR for the depression. We were in a depression by 32. He was elected in 32. He took office, I think, in March of 33. Now, it, it gets complicated because even during the, the, the election, uh, FDR indicated that he would probably take the U.S. off the gold standard. So people were worried about him taking that skill off the gold standard. So what do you do if you worry that he's going to take you off the gold standard? You go to the bank and you withdraw your gold because in those days the banks held gold versus your, your money. So everybody went to the bank and withdrew their gold, which caused the banks to collapse. So the banking crisis of 32, to a large extent, is probably the result of the expectation that FDR would take us off the gold standard, which he did in 1933 when he became president. So the expectation was actually true. Uh, once he got into office, I think everything he did basically was wrong, or almost everything he did was wrong. Uh, he raised taxes. He increased government spending. He created laws that gave huge amount of power to unions. But, but the original law, for example, around unions, around giving legal protection to unions, was passed under Hoover. Uh, what FDR did was expand it. Right? Um, so basically what you got from 33 to 36, the economy got a little bit better but not dramatically so, and they were pouring money into these stimuluses, and he was packing the Supreme Court, and he was doing all kinds of, all kinds of bad stuff. Right? And uh, in 33, it got better, and then in 33, 37, it collapsed again. And uh, by the beginning of World War II in 39, basically the economy had been flat for 10 years. Nothing had happened. And so you certainly can't say the FDR did anything good you know, in, in terms of the U.S. economy. And then people say... Well, then it ended because, you know, the war started. And uh, so if we're talking about economic mythology, then this is the biggest myth of all. The Great Depression, the idea is the Great Depression ended because of World War II, right? Because unemployment went down. During World War II, unemployment was very low. Uh, people were working. And uh, GDP, gross national product, went up quite a bit. So is this a good thing? So this is basically the most prevalent myth in economics. It's called the, and, and you can see it everywhere, but the stimulus package is just a, stimulus packages are just a form of this myth. This is the myth of the broken window, the fallacy of the broken window. The idea is this, and this is, goes back to Bastiat, and there's a wonderful chapter in, the, if you want, after read one, you should read one book in economics, right? And if, you have to, if you're going to read one book in economics, the book you should read is Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And his first chapter is in the broken window fallacy. And then he shows out everything in economics is really, the bro all the fallacies are broken window fallacies, really. They all are. So the broken window fallacy is this. You give a kid a rock, and you tell him to throw the rock through the baker's window. So he throws the rock through the baker's window, and the window shatters. Now what happens? Economic activity. This is cool. Right? The baker takes out his money and he goes and he buys a window. The window maker goes out and hires a workman to, to, to make a window. He then has to hire another workman to actually put the window into the baker's win into, you know, the glass into the baker's window. Wow, GDP just went up. Because we met GDP is measured by this activity. What's the fallacy there? That at the end of the day, all we have is a window, which we had before. So how could there be economic activity? There's nothing new here. Indeed, there's less. What has gone away? The baker's money. The baker's money that would have gone to do what? Build another furnace, maybe invest in the bank, which would have lent, would have lent the money to some entrepreneur, would have invented some new thing. So war is the same thing. This notion that we create economic activity by building tanks and then blowing up buildings 
is got to be the most bizarre notion in human history. Yet, Krugman holds this consistently. So when, when this big hurricane swept through the East Coast a few months ago, Krugman was cheering because it was going to destroy stuff. And when stuff gets destroyed, you have to rebuild it. And that creates economic activity. And isn't that cool? And, and he's right in this sense. The GDP goes up. Because the, when the window's there and the money's in the bank being invested, GDP is somewhat, GDP measures consumption. But the bank is not taking his money out of investment and he's consuming it by buying a window. So nominally, in the numbers, it goes up, but that's why GDP is a lousy measure of economic activity. It's not a good measure. So yes, during World War II, GDP went up, but did standard of living go up? Did quality of life go up? No, it went down. People died. And unemployment went down. Well, that's easy. You send half the male population overseas to fight a war, unemployment's going to go down. Okay. But the standard should be standard of living, quality of life. And that clearly went down in World War II, partially because your husbands and your kids were dying, and partially because you, know, you were working to build tanks instead of building, you know, making bread and making technology and building stuff that we actually benefit our lives. You're building stuff that blows stuff up. It doesn't create anything. So no, World War II was a disaster. What saved the U.S. economy is that after World War II, uh, they had realized that the disaster that the last 20 years had been, and they unwound a lot of the regulation. They freed up the economy. And, uh, and, and, they, and we went back on a pseudo-gold standard. So Bretton Woods, plus the fact that they deregulated a lot, they loosened up a lot of the controls that were imposed under FDR, made it possible for the economy to grow uh, starting in 1945-46. Real growth. Yeah, it's, it started under Truman and then Eisenhower. I mean, they didn't do a great job of liberalizing the economy, but relative to where we were before, they liberalized it. So they didn't go all the way as they should have, but they liberalized it a little bit, enough to get the, the entrepreneurial juices of Americans going. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you all.